Hello, happy, hello, happy lunchtime from New York. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Today, we at Mellon are very excited to welcome you to a conversation about the vital significance of artists as visionaries in times of crisis and all the time, and as essential workers who are foundational to a strong economy. A few weeks ago, we at the Mellon Foundation launched a new three-year, $125 million initiative called Creatives Rebuild New York. We did so partly to affirm the crucial role that artists play in sustaining us through the pandemic as they help us endure and envision paths forward out of the turbulent global economy. But these are eternal understandings of the importance of artists to our societies. We think that many more people now grasp the centrality of the arts to our shared human experience in a year marked by so much profound loss, uncertainty, and grief. Since the start of the pandemic, as always, artists told us the stories of who we are and what we were living through. I'd like to share one example of this work with a brief video clip highlighting the amazing dancers who participate, some of them, who participated in bubble residency programs during the pandemic. And this is such an incredible example of innovation and creativity in the face of great challenges. Mellon provided support for more than 360 dance artists, collaborators, and artistic staff to continue rehearsing and practicing their art while quarantining together. So what we'll be seeing are dancers who work in a variety of forms, modern dance, tap, ballet, uh, uh, other um, it forms, emerging forms, rehearsing in studios and on stage, as well as spending time together in quarantined living spaces. So a short video. All right, guys, very nice there, very good. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And we can't wait to see so many of these dancers perform live. Their work enriched us and revealed the beauty and the power of art to lift us up and to give us something to look forward to and find meaning in despite the fear and despair uh, of the pandemic itself. But these reasons, uh, and though very worthy, are not the only reasons that we launched Creative Rebuild New York. We also did so because we wanted to make clear that artists are essential workers, essential to our economy, essential to the communities that they hold together as a significant workforce, and a sense, uh, essential to our collective spirit, our sense of who we are as a we. Before COVID, New York State's $120 billion arts and culture sector accounted for nearly 8% of the state's economy and nearly half a million jobs. In New York City, um, where we are located um, in the Mellon Foundation, nearly 300,000 people were employed in creative industries. That's more than finance, tech, or education. But despite its size, the arts and culture sector of our state and city economies were obliterated by the pandemic. Not obliterated forever, <laughs> let's just be clear about that. Um, since March 2020, nearly 70% of performing arts jobs in New York alone, New York City alone, completely vanished. In another of our country's great cities, Los Angeles, nearly 110 jobs in the creative sector disappeared, nearly one quarter of that workforce. 
These are sobering statistics, and they are not limited to New York and LA. This is happening across the country. These artists and arts communities need the kind of action that uh, we believe Creatives Rebuild New York and so many other initiatives that we'll hear about today aim to undertake. CRNY, as we call it, will support a statewide program that provides 300 artists with full-time employment, benefits, and time designated for pursuit of their creative work for two years. CRNY will also support a no-strings-attached guaranteed income program that provides up to 2,400 artists experiencing financial need with monthly payments. Fundamentally, CRNY will provide thousands of artists with the income and stability they need as we begin to collectively move into the next stage of our society. So in our discussion today, uh, and I will um, bring us to our wonderful guests, we will dive deeper into the significance of arts and artists to the economy, as well as to our societal pandemic recovery and overall health. What we won't be discussing, just to be clear at this point, is how to apply for CRNY, though we know there's lots of interest, but um, now we're not going to be discussing eligibility, funding process, or other similar details those criteria and processes are still under development and being designed in collaboration with many, including artists, and that requires some time and rigor. So later this week, we will announce our CRNY advisors who will include artists, researchers, and nonprofit leaders. And at the end of August, we will release details about the funding process for CRNY. This afternoon, we plan to be expansive and inquisitive and to learn from one another about how we can keep working to support our country's artists and the creative and economic endeavors uh, that are, are, are so enriching to us. To our audience members, please say hello in the group chat. There are a lot of you out there and we know that you are from all over, so we would love to see that. And we will address um, questions in the last 15 minutes of the conversation. So now I am pleased to introduce our speakers uh, and thank them in advance for saying yes to our invitation and welcome them to the stage. Gonzalo Casals is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, where he directs cultural policy for the city of New York and oversees hundreds of millions of dollars in city funding for over a thousand nonprofit arts and cultural organizations. His many accomplishments include leadership roles at the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, Friends of the High Line, Create New York City, and El Museo del Barrio. And his voice and work have been featured in the New York Times, New York Magazine, WNYC, and the Huffington Post. Gonzalo, thank you for joining us and welcome. Kristen Sakota is director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, which advances the arts, culture, and creativity in the largest county in the United States by supporting hundreds of nonprofit organizations, coordinating public-private arts education initiatives, and managing the largest arts internship program in the country, among many other efforts. Her leadership in the field includes work with grant makers in the arts and, the, at the, and at the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and as a performing artist on stage from appearances with the dance and social justice company Urban Bushwomen. And to, I just got excited saying that, just thinking of what that means <laughs> to invoke Urban Bushwomen into this space and conversation. And to the musicals Rent and Mamma Mia on Broadway, welcome Kristen and thank you for joining us. And Glenn Ligon is a great artist living and working in New York who throughout his career has pursued an incisive exploration of American history, literature, culture, and society across extraordinary bodies of work that build critically on the legacies of modern painting and conceptual art. His recent shows include Grief and Grievance this year at the New Museum, which I hope you all saw many times uh, an extraordinary um, uh, pilgrimage and experience um, uh, that that show where um, Glenn acted as curatorial advisor and De Parisien Noir at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris in 2019. In 2011, the Whitney Museum of American Art held a mid-career retrospective of his work entitled Glenn Ligon America. 
and his work has been included in many international exhibitions such as the Dennis Biennale, the Berlin Biennale, the Istanbul Biennale that is just uh, selected. He is one of our great artists and treasures, and we are thrilled that he has joined us for this conversation. Glenn, we welcome you. Thank you. And so, I'm so glad to be here. To all of you, Gonzalo, Kristen, and 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 Glenn, uh, to use um, W. E. B. Du Bois's great phrase, "co-workers in the kingdom of culture," uh, I'm happy uh, um, that we are all here today. So let's start with some questions and hear hear what you have. Um, I want to open by um, giving us a little more detail from each of you about some of the challenges that you are undertaking in your various roles, uh, not only various uh, because you all are different, but within your own practices, your various roles. Um, and uh, I wanted to know, um, when we look at the almost catastrophic degree to which the pandemic um, exacerbated and accelerated trends of not only underemployment, but also underemployment for artists. How would each of you drawing from uh, the, you know, looking from where you stand, how would each of you characterize the current state of employment for our artist workforce and of the general fiscal health of arts and cultural organization, organizations, plural, excuse me, and what is your prognosis for these essential workers and organizations? And why don't we start with Kristen? Okay, happy to. Again, thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be in conversation with all of you. And I am calling in and joining in from Los Angeles County, uh, which I want to recognize is standing on the unceded territory of the indigenous peoples here, including the Tongva, Tatavium, Fernandinho, and others. Um, and they're still here and uh, we still support them and are uplifting their stories. So hi everybody, uh, thank you so much for being here um, and uh, happy to be standing here uh, with my long red locks and my bright orange necklace, clear glasses and a big smile, African-American woman. And with all that, I wanna say that, you know, um, this moment uh, has been, as you've said, devastating across the nation. Um, and I'll just speak a little bit more to kind of the perspective of Los Angeles. Los Angeles, as you mentioned, my uh, sort of purview is Los Angeles County, which is by population the largest county in the United States, more than 10 million people. It's a super diverse uh, place. Not only are there so many diverse people, so many diverse art forms, so many diverse languages, the geography is diverse. We're urban, we're rural, we're coastal communities, we're mountains, we're deserts. But it also is a complicated web of networks. Not only is there an incredible cultural community of cultural organizations, large and small, but also a really strong entrepreneurial spirit. So many artists, uh, small organizations, small by budget size organizations, organizations of color, as as well as the broader creative economy uh, in which this all sits, including Hollywood, uh, digital media, um, uh, design, fashion, and so much more. And so when the pandemic hit, you know, uh, really I see it as uh, the three crises that so many have talked about, hitting us in terms of a health pandemic, hitting us in terms of an economic crisis, hitting us in terms of a reawakening, perhaps, or a larger awakening around cultural and racial equity and the need for racial equity. And then I would even add another one for those of us who work on the public sector side, which there was somewhat of a crisis around, around the role of government so much, whether it was George Floyd uh, and all of those pieces, can't, I, I cannot disconnect from the time that has been this era. And so the artists, and the organizations within that saw immediately work stoppage, just automatically, all of the activities shutting down, theaters, uh, performing arts, film, movies, all of that was the first to shut down over long periods of time. And within that, uh, a real questioning of where we go from here, a real need for truth telling, so many uh, artists and creative workers who, who were not able to keep their jobs, but also this incredible resilience, this incredible way of continuing to give, continuing to create, continuing to produce and to sustain us throughout, whether it was paid or unpaid. 
So what we have seen is a huge sign of the depth and resiliency of a field, but a field that is absolutely a uh, huge need around recovery um, and needs a moment to be elevated to the place where it belongs in our economy, in our human and economic development. And there's so much more uh, to get into around specifically uh, what we're seeing with uh, organizations, for example, or uh, the last little point I'll give you is around uh, cash. So when we looked at the data, uh, when things happen and we looked at, well, what was the operating cash on hand for, for the average organization here in Los Angeles? At the time that the pandemic hit, most organizations on average uh, only had about a month and a half of cash on hand, period. And then we went into this long stretch. But there's also been some very interesting work by our colleagues at SMU Data Arts that really looked also at, let's look at black indigenous people of color identifying organizations and said, you know what? We've long associated them with more risk, but they were actually able to have an access capital and stay resilient using all the things they had been doing all along as an underfunded part of our sector. So really interesting stories around resilience, huge need for recovery right now to get artists back working, to get organizations to rehire um, and to elevate the role of the arts. Thank I'll you so there. much, Kristen. <laughs> okay, no, with, with so much say. Um, Gonzalo, um, how would you answer this question? You know, um, you, you mentioned, um, um, and this is something a lot of people are talking about, how the, um, the uh, pandemic accelerated trends that were already existing in our society. Um, and what we are experiencing now is that uh, although we all promised each other that we were not going to go back to normal, we have gone back to normal and I'm very naive mm. thought that uh, we were going to move directly to um, solutions. And now I understand that it's gonna take us a minute to figure out you know, exactly what was wrong and how we solve it, right? And in the meantime, we're gonna go back to the normal. So there's a moment in the pandemic, which is the very beginning of the pandemic that um, more than an accelerator, it acted as a magnifying glass. And it was a magnifying glass mm. of the problems and um, inequities of our society. And when you um, look at uh, surveys that were done, you know, at the onset of the pandemic, artists, um, teaching artists, were the ones that were the hardest hit, right? Were the first ones to get laid off. Um, that brings me back uh, probably four or five years ago um, when um, I was working with the um, Department of Cultural Affairs as a consultant on the uh, cultural plan. And we did a, a whole bunch of uh, focus groups um, across the city from like five people in a room to you know hundreds of people in an auditorium. And we were at Jack in Brooklyn and um, the person that was facilitating um, the, um, the focus group said, you know, let's make a list of what is it that you need to thrive in New York City as an artist. A working space, you know, materials, access to um, places, you know, platforms to show your work. And then she says, let's make a list of uh, what you need to survive as an artist in New York City. Affordable housing, affordable health insurance, uh, fair wages, um, you name it, right? And that's when I really quickly realized that um, a lot of the problems that our sector has were not going to be solved by, you know, the, a bubble created, you know, of a cultural plan. And that um, artists themselves are in this some kind of an informal economy in which because of the way they get paid, because of the way they get contracted, they cannot have access to affordable housing. They cannot have access to health insurance. Um, so while very much um, Kristen was saying that the, uh, the sector already entered the pandemic in a very precarious way, and mm -hmm. yes, we're very resilient, but uh, we shouldn't you know, rely too much on that. Um, artists were at the very bottom of that precariousness you know, of the sector. And how do we rebuild, how do we recreate, um, you know, um, as you're doing with this program, Elizabeth, um, you know, a role for artists in our society in which they can have, you know, a, a fair employment. Thank you. Glenn, what, what, what are you seeing right now? Well, um, I think there is a sort of sense that uh, some art world is coming back. Um, 
when the pandemic first started, you know, I, I, I wear many hats as, as most artists do. So I have a studio practice and I have a couple of employees, but I'm also on boards of arts organizations and grant giving organizations. So in my studio practice, when the pandemic first started, the question was, A, was the building that I'm my studio in going to actually be open? You know, uh, what were the protocols around that? So that was a question. And then we realized when the studio, that the studio building was going to be open, did I feel comfortable having my employees come in? And I didn't. So uh, we, we took a break. Um, but I realized that, you know, I have a responsibility to them. You know, I pay my ins uh, workers health insurance. So I kept them employed. So I had to sort of change my studio practice to figure out how to work remotely with them, you know, in a very hands on mm -hmm. practice, you know, um, mm -hmm. figuring that out and without any sense of how long that was going to last. Um, so it's sort of thinking through my responsibility to directly to the people that I work with, but thinking more broadly, um, I guess, in my other uh, role as, you know, uh, I say artists. Art is not even a good word, citizen for citizens, you know, and as citizens, as artists, we have a responsibility. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm on the board of a dance company. I'm on the board of a foundation that gives grants to artists. Um, I'm on the board of a small arts organization in Los Angeles. So each of these boards um, had to think through how they were going to operate. Uh, what kind of giving, you know, for the philanthropic board that I'm on, what kinds of giving we're going to be. So we joined an organization, Artist Relief Fund, and sort of thinking about how to give money directly to artists um, without a elaborate, you know, process of application because the need was so great and immediate. Um, and then the smaller arts organization, uh, Elizabeth in the film, they, you show people who are on the pod residency, and I'm on the board of one of those arts organizations that was the beneficiary of that pod residency. And it was transformative because up until then, there was no possibility for the dancers to work together. Um, and again, this, this, um, this company uh, that I'm part of, Akal Abraham, has committed to uh, full-time employment for dancers, but what does that mean in pandemic? And what does that mean when you can't effectively fundraise, when you can't rehearse for new pieces, when all the tours have been postponed or canceled outright? You know, so it was it was a very very challenging time. But I'm hopeful now because we have that sort of cushion um, in some ways around these foundations and granting organizations stepping up and giving uh, support to artists during the pandemic that we could in some ways be prepared for when things were going to come back, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we want things to come back in the same way that they had been. Though. So that's the difficulty now. It's like, it's, it's, it's something I struggle with in the studio. How do I want to work the studio? Do I want all my employees in at the same time, or can they work remotely? They've been working remotely, some of them, you know, for months now. Is that a good model? Should I continue that? You know, how many obligations do I want to have? Do I want to be on a plane every week? Because that's the way, you know, mm -hmm. at least my life as an artist has been. Do I want that anymore? But also in terms of the practice, what kind of work do I want to make now? What, what? Mm -hmm. urgency you know uh do i want to address in the work um and and so it's a it's sort of an interesting time and a lot of artists that i know are are dealing with these questions you know not simply you know dealing with the questions of like you know okay employment you know i'm a museum educator that's slowly coming back but can i wait <laughs> like i don't have you know mm -hmm. i i need employment so maybe I should be doing something else right now, or should I wait it out? You know, museum is going to open up mm -hmm. their 50% capacity now. So the tours are coming back, the class school classes are going to come back, you know, sh but can you wait basically? Uh, do you have the resources mm -hmm. to do that? 
Uh, do you have the resources to work on your own work, you know, while you're thinking about, you know, just like the day to day of like where, where a paycheck is coming from? So I think a lot of artists are struggling with that right now. And, um, but hopeful. I find a lot of our young artists are very hopeful, you know. Um, mm, mm. And Glenn, could you tell us, um, and I would love to hear examples from um, Gonzalo and Kristen as well, but I was fascinated when you were talking about your practice, the people who work with you in the studio, and then what happens when you're not able to physically be together. Could you just give us a small example of uh, what an adjustment or an innovation or a, a, a pause, I mean, you know, what, what that looked like for you? Right. Right. Well, I, um, you know, when I sort of closed the studio and uh, started working more from home, I realized, like, you know, I have a desktop now. Uh, I mean, not not a desktop like a computer, but literally a desktop to work on. So mm -hmm. what's the scale of work that I can do? And I started doing these very small collage works. Um, and got really into this sort of daily practice, which is which is funny for me. You would think that artists, you know, we go to the studio all the time, but I don't know if I had one thing that I did every day. And suddenly I had this one thing that I was doing every day. I was making these little small collages. Mm -hmm. Now in the end, they're terrible. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> nobody's ever gonna see them. But I got, uh, I realized that one of the ways that I engaged some of my employees was thinking about like, okay, I'm making this thing, but I have to size it up. I'm going to print them out. So I would send the image to an employee. They would work on it in Photoshop, send it to a printer place, print them out for me. You know, so it was sort of a new way of working for me, a new way of thinking through it. And again, mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone will ever see that work, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And and I'm I'm mostly a tech guy, and this work had a lot of images in it. And someone actually asked me last night, "Do you think that has a relationship to the pandemic?" And I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I thought, yes, I was working with images of people because I was in isolation, yeah. <laughs> you know? and it's yes, sort of that yes, kind of one so to one, which hadn't occurred to me in some ways, but was obvious when she said it. You know, like yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I was making these little self portraits again. No one will ever see these because huh. they're terrible. But I thought, oh, that's so interesting that that moment my practice changed was around this isolation, and suddenly I needed bodies. <laughs> like interesting, interesting, the representation interesting. of humanity in front of me to work on. So, mm. yeah. Wow, wow, <laughs> Gonzalo, Kristen, what what have you seen? Um, uh, an example of artists working in a different way or not being able to work? I mean, the whole range of what you've seen. There's something that came up as we were putting together, we just launched the um, artist, um, City Artist Core, which is um, a series of grants to help artists um, produce work. And as we were looking at the, um, the guidelines and the uh, restrictions, we were like, well, this is only for, we're New York City, this is only for artists that are living in New York City. It was brought to my attention, and I was ashamed that I did not think about that, that many artists had to leave New York City during the pandemic because they could not afford, by not having work, they could not afford to live in the city, right? And that's mm -hmm. something important to bring up as part of this fraud um, system in which um, we are um, putting artists uh, through. Um, but what was also really inspiring and interesting is that uh, many artists went out and make their work um, part of a mutual aid efforts and networks, right? Alicia, Alicia Grunion um, in the North Bronx um, doing work about just um, bringing food um, pantry to her neighborhood, you know, resources. Jacqueline Reyes, um, who was about to do a project uh, with the Landromat project in Little Manila here, here near Jackson Heights in Woodside, um, completely changed her project to be about, you know, how do we, how we use the restaurants, um, Filipino restaurants in, in the neighborhood as a source or a network for neighbors to access information about the pandemic and the early um, days of mm. the pandemic that nobody knew what was happening, right? So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I always say that uh, the creativity of the artist is what really help us make sense, you know, the changes that we're going through and what inspire us to um, take action. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kristen, what are some, what, what's, are some examples you've seen? Um, I can't hear Kristen. I don't know if the rest of us can. Oh, can you no. hear me now? Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I was just inspired by the creativity and adaptability of artists um, at any time. And absolutely, there were so many pivots. I mean, one, I'll just, two that come to mind. One is just, I mean, what you're doing at Mellon is extraordinary, Elizabeth. And the video, especially for me, uh, directly having so much lived experience with dance and the performing arts, where your body is an instrument, mm -hmm. the other bodies mm -hmm. is your materiality, so is space literal space, the distance between two people, the angle, all of that is part of mm -hmm. the artwork. So if you've only got mm -hmm. a five by seven room with a couch in it and a cat, that's gonna mm -hmm. deeply, deeply change your ability to practice, your ability to create work. Um, and so what we saw here in Los Angeles was uh, many, of course, closures of dance studios because dance companies couldn't hold on to making lease payments when literally no one could be allowed to safely enter the spaces for a year and a half. And so now we've seen what already may have been an affordability or space uh, issue around artists or crisis have a whole nother layer of meaning and urgency for those, especially in the dance and performing art world. But we also saw so many virtual uh, folks, so many folks doing a practice or teaching classes and suddenly reaching people all over the country, um, whether it was for sort of the average person, anybody could kind of take it, or there was really choreographing through video and doing practice. Um, you talked about Urban Bushwoman um, and, and another affiliator, Bushwoman, Maria Bauman, right on our Instagram, you'll see her kind of doing mm -hmm. her practice in her living room, uh, sort of almost a daily meditation or a new piece or a new thought. Um, and so many dancers did that, uh, which is which is incredible. I also really want to speak to some someone uh, that Gonzalo mentioned the educators, because a lot of times they kind of get uh, left out of the conversation. And I think we have uh, right now a system where educators are some of our most diverse, in, especially in the museum settings. Um, uh, they do this work, but are often not really s s uh, set up and maintained as structurally as they could be, they're often contracted out. They're viewed as more close to community. They may be grant funded. They may also have more of the uh, folks of color. And so when I heard from the pandemic immediately, oh, a lot of museums just got rid of the education staff because they're just thinking, well, I'm not gonna be able to touch and ex exchange with people, but that's a huge segment of our, of our population and our sector and a huge need in all of our communities. So one of the things we saw here was in our work uh, leading a public-private arts education initiative as well as repurposing state Juvenile Justice Prevention Act dollars and using those to fund arts education for systems impacted youth, what we saw was this immediate question of how do we pivot this work and still support youth who were isolated, youth who were cut off, youth who were going through their own changes or suddenly had to do everything through computers. And so our, our staff found ourselves supporting the arts organizations and teaching artists that they work with in how to, how to do this virtually. How do you teach or support virtually? We saw organizations literally giving out and creating art kits to give with the free school meals, mm -hmm. to keep a line of connection to those youth. We saw them going above and beyond. We saw youth incarcerated in the county system who used to have an in-person opportunity for, for this work mm -hmm. and they couldn't have access to the internet because of safety and other protocols. And the artists were trying to say, can we even do it by phone? Can we guide them through mm -hmm. and bring them materials? Because that's how dedicated, that's how essential it is. Um, but all of those things that just had to make sense of it. And then, you know, to the point that was raised this morning, well, where do we go now? Now that we're starting to transition mm -hmm. into what's possible next. How many things did work that we want to maintain? How many things do we want to change? And I think, you know, the last point that I'll just say that it reminds me of as well is, and Glenn, you really hit this home for me, is the, the need for life, for space, for access to materials, and that that can drive or at least largely influence what what kind of work can be made is also not just a pandemic issue, right? That's an equity issue. And I always think mm -hmm. about it as opportunity cost. 
what what would so many artists who who don't have access or young folks uh, or in you know communities of color what would they be making if they had the tools of mm -hmm. VR or a space to create that they felt was their own right. or they had the paint that they desired what would they make that's our opportunity I think to find out mm -hmm. That is very profound what you're saying right there, because um, I think that while we know that the last year and a half has certainly um, laid bare inequities uh, uh, with regard to, you know, health, economics and so forth with, with COVID itself, um, you know, it's just been as, as, as stark as I, I, any example I've ever seen uh, to show uh, who is more affected uh, by um, uh, illness uh, and, and, and precarity. Um, but the opportunity um, that comes through a rigorous equity analysis is a really exciting question. So uh, Gonzalo and, and, and Glenn, I'd, I'd love to hear what, what you think are, are, are some of the rethinks or opportunities or ways we should be thinking uh, differently or more strongly. Um, I, I think, you know, um, we need to um, rethink the economic system of the art, uh, cultural sector, right? Um, it's a trickle-down economy um, with the artists at the bottom. Um, and then uh, a study that I would like for somebody to do, um, hopefully very soon, maybe Kristen and Elizabeth and I, we can come together and, and, and do it, is how much mm -hmm. money... Um, we are spending, you know, national level in presenting work, and how much money we're investing in creating work, right? And um, it's a capitalistic system in which um, the uh, the uh, um, the priority is put on the object uh, or in the experience, and not necessarily on the person. So until we don't change that, until we don't start thinking, you know, like how important it is to to support the artists throughout the whole process, and, and that's where the value is, we're gonna continue to have um, these inequities and we're gonna continue to have this trickle land economy, um, which um, benefits uh, no one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, one thing that has to happen and, and certain um, online platforms like Change the Museum, I think have sparked many conversations around that is uh, you know the issue of transparency in the art world you know um someone you know i work with a gallery and someone was asking me like well you know do you ever talk to other artists about you know how you work with them and i said no nobody does you know we don't mm -hmm. know anything about each other's careers except for the work we don't know the mechanics of it mm -hmm. you know like what what cut do you get? You know, who pays for production and who doesn't? You know, so those kinds of conversations I think are happening between artists more and more because we realize that if we don't know, this this question of you know equity never gets kind of pushed forward because we don't have any transparency around how we operate. You know, with these mm -hmm. within these systems, uh, and we don't share that knowledge when we do have it. So. Um, mm -hmm. But also, I think, you know, one of the things just thinking about the gallery context is um, over the last year or so, I've seen many artists, uh, sort of curators of color enter museum spaces, you know, which has been fantastic. Um, but I was thinking also like, well, you know, where is the BIPOC bookkeeper? Where is, you know, who's at the front desk, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like I was getting a big painting photographed and i you know looked at the art handler and was thought there's one black art handler there are 10 people in this room you know mm -hmm. why are mm -hmm. why is that in new york city that's crazy <laughs> no. mm -hmm. um so thinking and trying to push these you know private institutions private galleries and public institutions to think more broadly about you know uh equity on, on all levels of employment, not just like mm -hmm. the front facing one, but like on the mm -hmm. back side too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, in order to think about today, I would love to um, go back in the day and, uh, and hear a little bit from each of you about um, early career 
experience uh, and understanding, you mentioned this briefly, Kristen, uh, that helps you think about what uh, might be possible now. For, for myself, I think back to the early 80s and CETA, the Comprehensive Employment Training Agency that uh, many of us knew about, um, and all of the arts and arts administrators who you know, ha had a CETA gig. Um, there was a sense that there was somewhere to go and that it was the government um, where you could um, you know, get something that could stabilize your ability to um, uh, to make art um, in in different cities. Uh, I, I was in D.C. in that time, and the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities was supporting all sorts of work with you know prizes and small amounts of money, but encouragement. Um, and it was there. There was a sense that it was a time. Um, and and by the way, the literary arts were an important part of a larger arts conversation, which I think in some ways has fallen away and, and we at Mellon with, with others have really been trying to say, hey, you know, writing is an art too. Um, so so um, I may be uh, being nostalgic, um, uh, but, um, but I do remember that as a, a hopeful time for a consciousness of what it meant to support the arts in the broader society. Um, how would you all talk about an early stage of career and what your experience or observation was about the climate for artists? Well, I can start. Um, I think it was 1989, I got a $5,000 grant for the National Endowment for the Arts for drawing. Um, and it was transformative. I mean, I, I was sort of joking with my family that who, you know, my arts career was somewhat mysterious. And I said, well, the government thinks I'm an artist. <laughs> it gave me money. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, uh, and, and subsequently they stopped giving money to individual artists, you know, because artists are kind of dangerous <laughs> for the powers that be. Um, so they didn't, they needed sort of like intermediaries to, you know, they, they wouldn't give money directly to artists anymore. But uh, at that moment, that $5,000 represented a big choice for me. I could continue working at proofreading at the law firm I was working at, or I could use that $5,000 and take a break and just say, okay, I'm just gonna focus on making my work now and see what happens. What does it mean to be a full-time artist? I'd never had that opportunity before. And that kind of launched everything for me, you know, got good to me, making my art full time on that $5,000. Um, so that kind of support was really, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of a joke in a way, you know, like when I say it, you know, like, oh, the government thinks I'm an artist, but that kind, that grant was really what changed my career in a lot of ways, you know, just the time off, you know. Um, and it seems like an absurdly small amount of money, you know, and I don't know what it would be in today's dollars, but, you know, just having some space um, from that opportunity was huge. Amazing. You know, um, uh, I, I st I'm starting to think. Go ahead, Kristen. Okay. Oh, no problem. You put me on the oh. app. Um, I was just going to say that after working in government for a year and a half, Kristen, you tell me if this is true, you start thinking everything in system processes and, and policies, right? And there was a grant program, uh, I think they're still around, and I believe it's called Creative Engagements uh, at LMCC, which what it does, it gives uh, funds to the artists and then ask the artists to go to a culture organization and propose a project. Um, but what's mm -hmm. brilliant about that is that it shifts the power dynamic, right? You know, rather the artist waiting for an organization to hire them, the artist has the budget, comes up with a project, and then goes uh, to the organization and says, this is what I want to do. And um, I think it's brilliant. I think it's a tiny little program, but, you know, it could really exemplify a lot of, you know, the power dynamics that, I'm, that I've been talking about in terms of, you know, the role of the artists and the, the, the place of the artists in, in, the, um, in the structure of um, the cultural sector. Um, I was happy to um, replicate a part of that on the uh, um, recent um, Civic Artists Corps uh, program in which money goes directly to the artists. You can 
do the project, whatever you want, and you can just go around and say, I'm paying for, let's do that something together with any cultural organization. Nice. Yeah, well, the things that come to mind for me, first of all, actually, as you were talking, and yes, absolutely, uh, as someone who now I'm, I've been over a decade in this type of seat, um, this local arts agency seat, I think I do now think in those in those terms. But it occurred to me as you were talking, um, you know, we've been doing so much work here for the last several years around the notion of cultural equity. Um, and for LA County, they put forward a big uh, policy initiative around anti-racism. So we're now much more explicit, um, full forth, that cultural equity and racial equity. As well as in GIA, Grant Makers in the Arts, where, uh, you know, in a recent conversation, a racial equity workshop, we were talking about how racism, bear with me, I'm going somewhere, how racism actually works across the individual level, the interpersonal level, institutional level, and the systemic level. And as you were talking, Gonzalo, it kind of made me realize that my my almost awakening or the ways that arts and culture has been in my life has actually almost followed that journey exactly. It started with just me as an individual, just having access to the arts um, and everything that went into that and all the systemic pieces that went into that as well. Um, the fact that my, my parents moved us from the south side of Chicago during a time of white flight to the first suburb west because they knew there were gonna be good public, free public schools and we had arts in schools. The fact that I was able to go to the ballet school where my sisters went and then, you know, and then moving there and then that interpersonal sort of my friends and my friend who said, I wanna be the first black ballerina. We didn't realize there already were some, but she later went to dance, dance theater of Harlem. She's an incredible, incredible ballerina, dark skinned woman who teaches ballet and still has to navigate that. Tanya Weidman, wherever you are, um, and moving into the interpersonal to later then realizing when my mind was blown after all the dance history and art history. And thank you for bringing up the Karen Finley and that entire sort of lineage of our history around supporting the arts and the tensions and the legal tensions as well around what's appro appropriate and, and how we support the arts here. Um, then seeing urban Bushwomen come to my school um, and later, only two years later auditioning and becoming part of that company, that was a time when that organization, we were dancing, but wherever we went for a residency, Kansas, Missouri, or Portland, Oregon, wherever we were, or Brazil, you know, so, um, El Salvador, or wherever we were, we were dancing, but we were also teaching. We were doing a community sing. Mm -hmm. We might talk to a women's uh, prison group. We might have a community council. We were doing an institute to teach dancers how they can advance social justice through that practice. And I used to have to explain to people all the time because it was so foreign to a lot of people in the art world. Mm -hmm. No, that is, that is the work. That is actually part of the work. We're a mm -hmm. concert dance company, professional. And all these pieces are part of Jolly's vision. That is part of the work. Fast forward to now and the notion of community engagement, the notion that you as a as an arts organization might do all these things is now almost like, you know, piece piece of what everyone does, right? So that blew my mind in my career, that the work is not only the individual, the ballet, the performance, the interpersonal, what I did on the stage, but that it was actually this piece of community and advancing these other pieces, that that is part of the work. And then finally, systemic. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed, uh, and it was at New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, um, and, and before I interviewed, a friend called and said, hey, I just had lunch with someone, and they're looking for someone to come in as their deputy general counsel. I'm a lawyer myself as well uh, by training. And I thought, you know, my parents were essential workers, uh, and so we're in like the VA hospital, and I thought government and the arts, ugh, no way. And it wasn't until, I'm serious, after all those performances that I had been in myself, or attended those logos on the back, the whole system behind it, I had no idea. Because remember, we have grown to have this professionalized arts administration, a master's in arts. Earlier on, that wasn't the way. Um, and so I didn't even know that entire system existed. And then I could become a part of it and try to push it. And, and lo and behold, uh, local arts agencies, the public sector plays an incredibly important role of working alongside the private sector um, in sustaining the field and pushing forward policy and equity. So that's my sort of big, big milestones that really opened my eyes in my career. <laughs> Elizabeth, we cannot hear you.
Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yep. Fantastic. Wonderful. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I would love to know also, um, just briefly, what what you all think. I think we shouldn't ignore the national. Uh, you know, we're talking about um, about municipalities, uh, albeit ginormous ones. Um, but what do you think? Uh, what should we look to? What should we hope for? What can we expect? What do you want from the NEA? Um, uh, as we await, um, you know, leadership and, and, and see, to see what the vision will be and what, what could, let's like, you know, dream it as big as we want it, a Biden Harris arts policy look like. Mm. Woo, I have just, this is like my, my dreams <laughs> coming to life that have come starting in Obama era. Right, like anyone is like, Papa, I'm like, call me, call me. Okay, so uh, <laughs> just kidding. All right, so I want to say just a couple things that come to mind. Um, one, when you're talking about national, I must acknowledge that in addition to all the work that we have been doing here, uh, LA County and Department of Arts and Culture, we were able to be part of with Mellon and others, essentially uh, an initiative to support Los Angeles, but nationally and working with other funders. And I think these funder collaboratives and these public-private initiatives can be of critical importance and a great way to innovate, but also to pool resources and to signal the value of the arts in, in national initiatives, in regional initiatives. And so I just want to give a big lift to the arts ed collective work that we do here, public-private, and uh, the LA Arts Recovery Fund as an example of funders coming together um, across the country um, to invest, as well as artists at work um, that Mellon is supporting um, and that we look forward to partnering on. But as we think about, you know, the NEA or the role of the federal government, well, first of all, I'll just say, you know, I'm a firm believer that the government should support the arts. But I think it's bigger than that. I think we have an opportunity and maybe, maybe we need to think of it as more of a, also an obligation to shift some of these narratives. How can we shift the narrative, the civic narrative around the role of the arts to elevate how much it matters in our lives from health, literally, you will be a healthier community if you have more access to the arts right there in your community. Social Impact of the Arts Project taught us that. Look at the economy, $200 billion annual output for the creative economy in LA County alone. The economy, it's huge, plus it drives other sectors, right? Um, and so then there's healing, uh, then there's education and youth development, and then there's the incredible role that I think is maybe not articulated enough at the federal level that the arts could play around anti-racism, around a belonging strategy, as our friend Roberto Bedoya might say, because we're a visual people. We are an experiential people. So the arts can actually push us to see the humanity in one another. So that maybe when that boy is walking, that black boy with that hoodie, the first thing through your mind is not gonna think that he's a criminal because you've actually seen, you've stepped into his shoes in theater, you've thought of other things, you've interacted with other people, you've seen other stories and you've seen yours valued as well. I think it is critical. And so what I would love to see is for either this administration, hopefully, or the next one, uplift the role of the arts, well fund significantly all of those organizations, the NEA, the NEH, so that they can ensure that arts and culture is thriving in every community, rural, it doesn't matter. Everybody has arts. They just don't all have the same access and the same infrastructure. Let's uplift all of them and what indigenous rural communities might need might be different than what we need here. And then elevate it from a policy point of view. Give us someone who sits in the cabinet. Give us someone who understands the role of the arts across sectors. Let's do it. It's possible. Um, there are organizations and, and individuals putting these these ideas forward, um, but I think it's on the Biden-Harris folks or anyone else uh, in those kind of shoes to really take it and make it so and ensure that along the way they listen to artists and they listen to uh, the diverse sector that we have all across the country. Okay, off my soapbox now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, put the cherry on top of the cake that uh, Kristen just built, right? You know, um, everything that she said, plus um, all the problems uh, that Kristen just mentioned goes back to uh, the decision by the, it, during the creation of this nation that um, because of uh, freedom of expression, this country wasn't going to have cultural policy. And the decision of not having cultural policy is actual. Is, is that actually a cultural policy decision, right? 
And that is the root of all the problems that Kristen just said, in which um, arts and culture is always parallel in one corner to the rest of you know, a municipality or a national um, federal government, right? You know, like it seems that this is not um, part of the government um, because um, we don't have that cabinet position, right? Because we, we have not given ourselves the permission to create cultural policy at the level of, at the federal government level. Well, I just will add on to what both of you have just said and thinking about, you know, if the Biden-Harris administration is an administration, which I think it is, that's not scared of artists, that will be good. You know, I remember under the Obama administration seeing many photos of the Obamas going to a museum, you know, they're not scared. They weren't scared of art. They weren't scared of artists. They weren't scared of being in dialogue with them. And so hopefully the Biden Harris administration will continue that legacy. But I think the idea of a cabinet level position for the arts would be amazing, you know, because it's, as we've seen under the previous administration that, you know, funding for the NEA was always in jeopardy. You know, it, it, it had a few saviors, but we shouldn't be in that position depending on, you know, who's, who's sitting in the White House. Agreed. And if I can just add one other little right. thing, which is just to say there are beautiful shifts happening at the NEA even right now. Um, mm -hmm. And we hope that continues. Uh, and just that as you are doing, Elizabeth, at Mellon, they can take a page from the WPA and the CETA and bake into mm -hmm. the infrastructure plan an entire piece dedicated to arts, culture and creativity that actually drives a lot of our economy, as well as our well-being uh, all across the country. So let's hope that happens. Thank you. We have so many fantastic questions coming in. And so I am going to throw some your way. And since there are a lot, um, anyone can jump in with, um, with, a, with a quick answer. Um, let's see. OK, this one. Um, how can we support the cultural ecosystem, artists and those that support and interpret their work, the handlers, curators, educators, administrators, we've mentioned that, and organizations? Um, how, how do we think further, so I guess this is pushing our thinking, about um, the whole cultural ecosystem, uh, even as we look to the artists who make the work themselves? Anything else we can throw out there about that? Hmm. I think it's just um, what I was saying at the, at the beginning, right? Making sure that um, folks have, you know, dignity in their employment, right? Um, fair wages, you know, um, um, policies, employment policies that are supportive of the work that they do um, because um, that's what, you know, um, sends a message that the work that you're doing is valuable and is important. Um, mm -hmm. How many times um, we are seated in a meeting um, talking about an artist project and we, we just go around the room and everybody that on the table is paid a salary and is being paid for being there and the artist is sitting there waiting to see if the commission will come up and if we will get paid or not, right? I, I keep insisting in the systems because um, First of all, I'm obsessed uh, that I don't want us to make the same mistakes that we made before and change those systems. But I think, you know, they're at the root of a lot of the problems that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would just gonna... echo mm -hmm. that uh, real quick uh, by just saying one other thing I think we could do. Sometimes there's the saying, uh, you can't manage what you don't, what you can't, what you don't measure or something like that. So certainly continuing to measure the economic impact or the numbers of artists, et cetera. But I also think making things more visible because we have all these myths of like, you know, the crazy artist that goes away and magically, and it is magic, art is magic. But people don't know what actually goes into hanging a painting. People don't know what a registrar is. People don't know, none of that. So how do we make that more visible to everybody? Maybe it starts with youth and in education or maybe not, but I think making it more visible too. I think also from, that just to echo that, that visibility uh, gives people who wouldn't have considered 
you know, careers in the arts, the possibility for it. If you don't know what a registrar is, you don't know that you might want to be one, you know? Mm -hmm. And of course that, as you mentioned earlier, Glenn, is another space where comprehensive thinking about um, equity and opportunity um, can really, um, really make a difference. Um, now, here's another question. We've been talking about um, uh, our largest cities um, and places that are known in part for their dynamic arts communities. Mm. Um, how are you thinking about smaller places, uh, places that don't have uh, such a high concentration of artists? This would be sort of how are you thinking as, as citizens uh, uh, of culture? Um, um, you're doing your work where you are. Um, um, how do you think about what um, both what is happening there and also um, ways that more could be, um, if not, I, I don't want to say brought there, but but supported and and encouraged there. I think uh, that's something that we learn uh, with the social impact uh, for the arts, which is, um, uh, the project that my predecessor Tom Finkerpel. Um, started um, by um, understanding, you know, the impact of the arts in communities. And it started with a extension or expansion of the definition of culture, right? And um, when you look at arts and culture in a community that you might think is a, is a cultural desert because you don't have a Met, you don't have a MoMA, you don't have a Philharmonic, um, you have a church choir. You have the person that teaches art at the local library. You have an and you know, and those in those small communities, those individuals, those entities have a tremendous impact um, in their communities, bringing you know better public safety, social cohesion, and uh, better health, and on and on and on. Um, so we have to be careful um, about you know, like when we look at um, the smaller the smaller communities. Um, not to think that they are starved for um, cultural experiences. Sometimes the cultural experiences are so much more impactful to their um, communities than, you know, the bigger museums or philharmonics or you name it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump into that one? Sure, I'll just say agreed. And here in the in the LA County Cultural Equity and Inclusion Initiative, geographic equity, as we like to call it, is a huge uh, part of that conversation because uh, anywhere there could be a lack of access, transportation, but also it's such a huge region. And there are places where there aren't as many existing sort of official nonprofit arts organizations or CBOs. So how do we ensure that access? How do we ensure that? And I think from a public policy lens, absolutely, as Gonzalo said, you could look systemically and say, look at all the parks, look at all the libraries, or you could kind of go grassroots. Who's supporting the, the individual artists um, that are there, not only sort of really supporting it always mediated through a large museum or a large um, institution. So I think that is uh, at least one of the approaches. I would also just say for anyone out there who's trying to make further moves, there are lots of things that could be on hand in your community too. There could be venues that are not nonprofits, that are other kinds of live venues that could be relative to you. Like we said, the, the social infrastructure, parks, libraries, et cetera. There are also things like your chamber of commerce or your business improvement district. Are there ways that they could even get in and support? Um, because those are not just in major cities like LA and New York, those are all over the country. Um, and so mm -hmm. there are ways that folks can get involved everywhere. Let me throw out another question. Um, recognizing the key roles that philanthropic and government funds play in supporting artists, and that's largely what we've been talking about today, where do you see possibilities for private capital, uh, including impact investing, reads the question, in contributing to sustainable creative lives and the broader creative economy? And uh, I would, uh, you know, dis just amplify and distill the part of that question. What about the private wealth that doesn't it can give they, people can give it to anything they want to, um, and there is so much there. Um, so how do we think about you know partnerships and activations? Maybe this is the the day that I get fired, but I, I always I, before I became a commissioner, I would always say that. Uh, is it the role of um, DCLA or, you know, um, DLA County? What's the name of your um, Department office? of Arts and um, Culture. Department of Arts yeah, and Department Culture. Yeah, Department of Arts and um, Culture. Is it, a, 
is it our role um, to distribute money um, equally to everyone, or is our role to distribute the money to bridge um, the gaps, right? Knowing that there's mm -hmm. um, private philanthropy, there's private wealth that is distributed in a way that is um, very specific, and do we come in and we bridge the gap? Um, mm -hmm. And I always wonder, you know, how would that work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is some, oh, just on that point, oh, I was just going to say there is an interesting, no, I cannot remember which study it is, but a study that Data Arts SMU put out where they did actually show that in their look at organizations, the, the public sector is perceived as actually pushing equity farther than the private foundations and farther than the individual donors. And it's in part because we have this uh, mandate, really, to at least at a minimum be thinking kind of lowercase d democratic. If not now at this point, not only equality, does every district get the exact same amount or equity? We're, we're really looking at that and on the kind of for, um, forefront of that as well. I would also just say, absolutely, you're right, Elizabeth, there is also a lot of private money um, and a lot of good that can be done. And, you know, look at the Mackenzie Scott grants. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff happening, whether they're one time, which is a catalytic piece, but is also modeling a certain kind of trust and a certain kind of, I did all my research you know you, you do you. And let me give you something, you know, catalytic, which is incredible. How do we also make this sustainable? And how do we ensure that arts and culture is something at the top of a lot of philanthropic agendas? Um, because sometimes folks want to do their own thing, you know, but right in their backyard or, or something very far away, you know, Africa or whatever, but something right in their backyard. It's like, but you do know right, right here. And the, the Hollywood mm -hmm. industry, you made your wealth in art. Mm -hmm. Let's make this visible. Art is part of that. Uh, the round table, when you, if you, anybody watched, uh, you know, the Star Wars, they had did a round table, these diverse directors mm -hmm. they hired. They didn't plan it. I listened. Every one of them talked about art school or how they got started uh, in illustration. Uh, Every one of these diverse directors um, on that show, if you look at the extras, they had did a whole round table and every one of them cited art, straight up art in some way was part of there. We gotta make that visible because the folks are mm. not funding it to the degree that I think the private sector could um, or in partnership with the public sector. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. There are some private models. Uh, I'm thinking of art for justice, you know, as a model of like, let's focus on a particular area, but focus on it widely in that area and let's, take the overhead down, you know, so that we give more mm -hmm. money to these institutions and let's cap it, you know, at a certain time length. Yeah, I think it's five years where we're gonna spend this money, you know, rather than like, we're gonna save it <laughs> so we can be yeah. here for 20 years, you know? So I think, you know, more, you know, I, I, in talking to Agnes Gunn, who's the benefactor of Art for Justice and about her, you know, uh, talking to other wealthy people to join on to this, you know, she it was an uphill battle for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really, it's really interesting that there is so much private money, but in some ways it can be very, con often it's very conservative, you know, and will mm -hmm. only fund things that seem, you know, pre-approved, <laughs> mm -hmm. won't go out on mm -hmm. limbs. And then, and I mm -hmm. think we need, you know, maybe it's an interesting time because there's so much wealth from the tech sector and, and, and um, that kind of giving seems like it's opened up possibilities for sort of more expansive notion of philanthropy than previous generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Glenn, you're just um, about... when you're saying that, oh. it, it reminds me, if, if you don't mind, it reminds me I was yeah, doing yeah. an exit interview of one of my uh, um, team members at DCLA, and he says, you know, this agency and every foundation in the country should have an R&D um, um, department in which you're constantly thinking and innovating, you know, and testing um, the ways in which you distribute, you know, funds. And um, we're not that, um, at, for sure, in public sector, and, you know, philanthropists right. were not that innovative. Right, right. I love right. that idea. And I love the uplift of Art for Justice Fund, an incredible model in so many levels. Um, so excited about that work. And we'll just say we're also seeing interesting shifts here in LA 
where we have seen some of our colleagues in private philanthropy, uh, the Parsons Foundation, for example, who's part of LA Arts Recovery Fund, but like blowing, moving past their 5%, perhaps, and saying, actually, mm -hmm. we need to push now. This is something mm -hmm. we, we need to, to expand. We are seeing some of those new models and, and across the country. Um, we're seeing some of these further further models, further changes, introspection, um, that I think is could really catalyze things. I also just want to pick up one thing we didn't talk as much about was um, you said something about models or innovative or entrepreneurship. Certainly the mm -hmm. San Francisco, uh, the Fed, the Federal Reserve has been doing a many interesting sort of like white papers on the role of arts and culture as part of mm -hmm. investment innovation. And so I think we might see a future that really thinks about also sort of innovation and seed capital. I think there are some dangers though around debt um, and, and are we gonna leverage artists you know, in a way that we don't wanna do? How do you think about what is, what is that return on investment if it's not sort of philanthropic, it's sort of seed capital, but like, what does that look like? Um, and yes, tech sector, we need them in the game on the arts uh, because the analysis seems to show that they've stepped into the, to the level of wealth, but are not necessarily funding the arts specifically. We are just about at time, but um, there is a wonderful question that I'd love to close with. Um, as we are in uh, an emergent moment, if um, each of you could briefly uh, tell about an encounter uh, with art um, since the pandemic as we've emerged? Great question. Um... I'll start. <laughs> you know, I, I just to get us started, but um, I, I just remember going to see Theaster Gates's show. This would have been, you know, a few months ago. And moving from the area where there it was a big space and there were paintings and I had a mask on and there weren't, you know, there were only a couple of people there and I thought, okay, this is what it's like. And then moving into a room where he had all of these sculptural beings who were in proximity to each other. It was a community of art and moving in and out and brushing past these sculptures felt to me like it was literally ushering me into what we had to come back to and that is body to body close together and those inanimate objects were not inanimate at all. And it just made me remember why art, as you say, Kristen, is magic. I, I had a uh, similar I'm gonna show experience. show off a little oh, bit. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Clint. No, go ahead. Please. Oh, no, I was just saying I had a, a similar experience seeing Julie Moretz's <laughs> retrospective at the Whitney, uh, realizing how long she's been engaged with, you know, what, what the artist Mark Bradford uh, called social abstraction. That is like abstraction mm -hmm. that's deeply rooted in the politics of the moment. And being in those spaces and, you know, maybe 25% capacity at the time for museums in New York, maybe it was a little higher. So not many people there, but in a way the the sort of hopefulness in her work, the scale of her work, the scale of her talent and ambition around the work, her generosity towards other artists. She also runs a nonprofit that's about residencies for artists. Um, was sort of exhilarating to kind of feel like, oh yeah, this is the art world. I want to come back. You know, it's like if we're gonna mm -hmm. change the way we come back, I want this to come back, you know, as the new model. You know? mm -hmm. Thank you. Gonzalo, you were going to tell us. I was going to say, yeah, I, I just show off a little bit my 50 minutes of fame. Um, uh, Lori Anderson did a, an amazing um, <laughs> show at the Park Avenue, Park Avenue Armory um, four weeks ago or so. Uh, it was a sound installation, um, and um, the, the installation calls for two folks, two people reading the names of um, folks that died of uh, COVID. Um, in New York City, mm. and I was, um, because of the privilege of the position that I sit, I was invited to be one of those readers on the opening night, and I had this very beautiful private moment, um, having myself uh, been sick of COVID, and, and living in what was the epicenter of the epicenter, of just spending an hour mm. reading names of people that died of COVID, mm. and you could do a little bit of racial profiling by looking at last names' names, 
and it was very telling, you know, um, who was affected the most. Um, mm -hmm. um, but it was also for me, it was sort of a very healing moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kristen? Wow. Um, um, these are incredible. Uh, and Julie Mertu, I, I feel like that was my last thing pre-pandemic was her installation at LACMA or something. Anyway, that was one of the, I feel like that was one of the big, last big things that I kind of remember. And then during the pandemic, I feel like listening to a whole album, I was like, remember you actually love music and ah, how transformative it is to listen to an entire Erica Badu out. Like how much this was your <laughs> life. These were, you were, you were having mm -hmm. conversations with these songs, with these people. Like that really got me through. Um, and I'd say at this point, uh, stepping back out now, it's a lot about outdoor music. So the, the LA Phil mm -hmm. uh, and the Hollywood Bowl reopening, and we were able to access tickets for uh, some of our staff to these big essential worker concerts that they started to reopen the bowl um, and that was incredible and then we're funding a bunch of free concerts in the parks here so over 200 concerts oh super super well this has been such a rich conversation and i i thank you all so much gonzalo casals kristen sakota glenn ligon for bringing all of your brilliance and big hearts and minds to this really important and kind of huge zone uh, of, of stuff to talk about. Um, this was great. And I thank you also to all the people who tuned in uh, in the middle of your day to, to listen and all of the wonderful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And so we hope to see everybody at more Mellon Foundation events. And uh, I love that we ended on that note um, because I want to say, like, whether you do it, whether you listen to your Erica Badu record right where you sit and have that vibe, <laughs> or whether you go out uh, into the world um, every single day, um, art is waiting for us to give meaning to our lives collectively. Um, so um, uh, the hugest of thanks to people who make stuff. All right. Thank you very, very much, right. everybody. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>